Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Clinton. We're so glad that you've gathered here with us online today and we want to invite you to let us know that you're watching and where you're watching from and who you're watching with. I'm the host of today's service, which means that if you leave a comment or have a prayer request or have a question, I'll be the person that you're talking to in the comments. Let us know too if you want to know more about our church, if you're interested in joining, or if you have any prayer requests. Welcome again. We're glad you're here. I'll meet you in the comments. There are walls between us By the cross you came and broke them down broken down there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you called me out of the grave you called me into the light you called my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. Back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing, we're alive, cause you're alive. You called me out of the grave, you called me into the light, you called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out. We're alive, cause you're alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Hey friends, it's good to see you today and so glad that you've joined us for worship. And uh, before we get on with our service, we have a really special thing to share and that's some people who've joined our church and who are joining today. Last week, John and Diana Speed joined our church during the 9 a.m. service and we're so grateful to have John and Diana as part of our worshiping community and grateful to have them um, join us on our journey of faith together here at First United Methodist. Welcome, John and Diana. Uh, also today, we are excited to receive into membership Brittany Mitchell. Uh, Brittany has been worshiping with us and is part of our online worshiping community now, and we are grateful to have her and grateful that she is connected with us and has stayed connected in our online community. And so we are receiving her by transferring of her membership and so excited to welcome her. So welcome, Brittany. Thank you for joining, and thanks for saying yes to following Jesus here at First United Methodist. And so friends, if you're out there and you're considering to whether or not you should make that next step of faith, to, to make one step on your journey of discipleship, we would love to have you join. 
you're interested in membership, you see how easy it is. It's just a matter of saying yes and being welcomed into the family. So if you're interested, why don't you type in the comments below or send a direct message to the church. And uh, Pastor Sharonda is on there right now, and she'll be able to respond to you. We'd love to talk to you about membership. We'd love to talk to you about your next step in faith. In fact, today we're talking about everyone's next step in faith. All throughout the month of October, we are looking at resetting our face on Jesus, of renewing our minds in Christ. And today we're continuing by looking at God's call for us to be reconciled to be forgiving and being forgiven, to live into God's call to be ministers of reconciliation. So today, we're going to be honest with each other about how sometimes we don't really want reconciliation. But in spite of that, God calls us to live out our new life by being reconciled to Him and to each other. So thanks for being with us. And thanks for opening yourself to the opportunity and the possibility of being reconciled and made new. Welcome. Won't you join me in saying the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
and I believe that he gave his life Hey boys and girls, it's good to see you this morning, and I'm excited to share a few moments with you. And so, uh, come down front, get close to the screen. Wait, too close, back up a little bit. There you go, right there. And uh, I'm excited to be sharing with you this morning uh, about a really, really important topic and a pretty long word that we're gonna learn together. Thanks for being with us. Friends, I want to talk to you today about uh, an important word. It's a real long word, but I'm not going to say the word just yet. Instead, I'm going to tell you about me and my sister. Now, growing up, my sister was uh, a couple years older than me, and she was bigger than me, and she also got in trouble a lot by the way that she treated me. I remember there was this one time where her and her best friend decided to play tug-of-war with me. Um, have you ever played tug of war? You know, where people get on in either side of the rope and pull to see who's the strongest? Well, they were going to play tug of war with me, but I was the rope, right? So, long story short, I had to dislocate my elbow, had to go to the doctor. My sister got in a whole bunch of trouble. And then my mom said, I need you to tell your brother you're sorry so y'all can make up, which we did. Uh, then there was a time in which my sister was supposed to be babysitting me, and instead she told me that we should play a, uh, a board game, and uh, whoever won the board game could um, uh, take the other person's bedroom for their own. And so I didn't know what I was doing, and she decided that we should play the game chess. I don't know how to play chess. I don't even know if my sister knew how to play chess, but she made the rules, and guess what? She won. So she won my bedroom, which meant I had to move out. And so she packed up all my stuff and moved me into the laundry room. Later that day, mom and dad came home, found me curled up on my little sleeping bag on top of the washing machine, and my sister got in trouble again. She had to apologize. I had to forgive her. We had to make up. Now, Honestly, I've got about 25 other of these stories, but we don't have that much time about how my sister always mistreated me. Now, if she were here, maybe she would tell a story about how I did something wrong to her, but I don't remember any of those. In any event, my mom always wanted us to forgive one another, to make up, and to play nice. And there's a word for that. It's a, a word in the Bible. That's our long word. Are you ready for it? Reconciliation. Can you say that? reconciliation. And it's a long word, a fancy word, that means making up. When people have gotten into an argument, gotten into a fight, said things they shouldn't have said, done things to each other they shouldn't have done, we are called by God to make up, to forgive, to reconcile. Now sometimes it's hard work because we don't feel like it. And there are a lot of things that we adults don't feel like doing. And making up with one another is oftentimes one of those things. But Paul, in the Bible, tells us that because God loved us so much and forgave us and reconciled with us, He wants us to do that with everybody else. To forgive, to say we're sorry when we're wrong, and to make up with our sisters and brothers, with our friends, with our family. Reconciliation. That's our word of the week. So go practice it. And not just the word, but practice saying I'm sorry, being forgiven, and making up with our friends and family. All right, boys and girls, thanks for visiting with me. Thanks for being here. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you next week.
join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. I want you to think of somebody in your life who has mistreated you. Someone who's done you wrong. Someone who's maybe said something that wasn't true about you. Someone who's mistreated you. Someone maybe that let you down. Uh, Think about that person. I'll give you a, a second here. I bet for a lot of you it popped right to your mind. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a a coworker. Maybe it's a best friend who you've had a falling out with and you haven't spoken to for years. Are you thinking about that person? Now let me ask you, what would it take for you to forgive them? What would it take for you to be reconciled with that person? That person who the very thought of them right now makes you angry. What would it take to be reconciled again? Would it take an act of God? Well, if so, the good news is that is exactly what we're going to be asking for today. For God to show us the power and the importance of reconciliation. Now, I think we all have people in our lives that have wronged us, and without a doubt, we have probably uh, wronged other people. None of us is immune. Now, some of those people may have hurt us on purpose, but honestly, most often it is an accident, right? We forget about something. It's a simple mistake, an honest mistake. We forget someone's birthday. We neglect to tell someone um, uh, that we're thinking of them or call when they're sick, and they get their feelings hurt, and we get our feelings hurt. And, And sometimes weeks, months, years go by. We can't even really remember what happened. Or maybe we promised to do something for somebody, and we dropped the ball, and now they're disappointed with us and they don't trust us anymore, or vice versa. I think a lot of our personal conflicts arise out of honest mistakes. People seeing things differently, having different opinions, different beliefs, and they can be honest disagreements or honest mistakes because we are all human, right? All of us. And when things start to get personal, we get defensive, we begin to hurl insults back because we want them to feel as bad as they've made us feel. Before we know it, things get out of hand and that, that anger <laughs> comes back and we, we don't know what to do with that. It's only human to have those responses. It's only human to fall into those situations. It's only human to have these conflicts. But the thing is, because it's only human, that's exactly what God wants to address when He calls us to reconciliation. In our scripture passage today, we're going to read from the Apostle Paul, his second letter to the Corinthians. And I want to read this section, just a few verses from chapter 5. Verses 16 through 19. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know Him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself 
through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. In these just brief verses, Paul, Paul is challenging us to, to change a perspective, to change a point of view, to recognize something that has happened to us, and as a result, to do something. And I want to look at those three steps that Paul outlines. Now, if you recall, in this sermon series, we've talked about um, resetting our focus on Jesus. And for those of us who have reset our focus on Jesus, the next step is daily renewing our minds, daily engaging in, in study and in prayer and serving others. And it's in that daily activity that our minds are renewed. And so for those of us who have, who have reset our focus and have been renewed daily by Jesus, the next step is to recognize that something has changed in us. And Paul says it here in the very beginning, we no longer should see one another from a human point of view. Now, in the Greek that Paul uses here is actually the Greek word sarx, which actually means flesh. We should no longer see each other in the flesh, which is an odd thing for us that are bodied people, right? But really he means that we should no longer look to each other's outward appearances to make a judgment call. We should no longer base our opinions, our thoughts, our minds on, on these human categories of division. And it's not just what we look like, but also what we say and how we interact. The, these are very human realities, and Paul is challenging those who have committed themselves to following Christ to give up our judgmental ways of looking on outward expressions and making those types of judgments. No longer should we see each other from a human point of view. So that's step one in this um, new way of living for Paul. Second, he says that we're in Christ and therefore we are new creation. So, for those of us who desire not to view one another from a human point of view, we have to realize that we have been changed. We have been made new in Christ. We are a new creation. And he says the old ways of viewing and understanding people have been swept away. It's very similar to what Paul will write in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verse 28, where he says there's no longer Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free, all of those divisions, all of those distinctions, which are so often the source of conflicts, what makes us different from each other is where we find a lot of our conflict. He says all of those are, are meaningless in the new creation. The old is gone. The new creation has come. We are all children of God, and everything, therefore, is different. We are a new creation. That's why we don't view each other the same way anymore, not because the distinctions have gone away, but rather we have been transformed. And therefore, when we look on each other, we no longer have to see the distinctions that have brought so much conflict. We are in Christ. We are a new creation. And then third, he says, because God has reconciled us through Jesus, we are to now work for reconciliation with others. Paul never lets us forget that we are sinners. And Paul will often refer to himself as the chief among the sinners. We're all sinners. We're, we were all living in a broken relationship to God and with one another. We were selfish. We were self-centered. We judged other people by the mistakes they made while being blind to our own. And the work of reconciliation began with God in Jesus, showing our own need for forgiveness. And when He showed us that He had wiped our slates clean, 
He then asked us to do the same for others. Because we have been reconciled, we who are a new creation, we who have been called to no longer look at each other from a human point of view, we are called to live out our own reconciliation by being reconciled and doing the hard work, perhaps the hardest work that Christians are called to do, to forgive, to receive forgiveness, and to work to be reconciled. Now, Paul himself is not a stranger to this hard work of reconciliation. In fact, Paul is not a stranger to conflict with the Corinthian church. This church that he's written this letter to is a church that he has deeply and dearly loved, but a church that has often broken his heart. After Paul writes the letter that we know as 1 Corinthians, um, he decides to visit the church in Corinth. And while he's there, Paul is confronted and insulted by one of the members of the church there in Corinth. Now, we're not sure exactly what he said or exactly what happened, but we can kind of tell by the context clues of Scripture that this man has accused Paul of being a fake apostle. He's not impressed with Paul, doesn't agree with his teachings, doesn't consider him to be a legitimate apostle, and he doesn't think Paul is someone the church should listen to. Now, Paul is not unfamiliar with this line of attack. He got it often around the Mediterranean world as, as people cast doubt on Paul, and he would often have to defend himself. But what hurts in this setting and what breaks Paul's heart is that when this happens in Corinth, none of the other church members, none of the other leaders speak up to defend Paul. I don't know why. Maybe the guy that did the talking was a, um, a person they just were used to ignoring. <laughs> Maybe they were scared that this guy would then turn on them. Or, like a lot of churches, they just said nothing because we like everything to be peaceful and sweep everything under the rug. But for whatever reason, they don't speak up to defend Paul. And Paul is heartbroken. This church, the church in Corinth, is a church that Paul founded himself. He started this church. He was the first to preach the gospel to many of these people. And now they seem to, to turn their back on Paul. Or at least in their silence, condemn him to, to the accusations that this man has made. And so, Paul leaves. He leaves Corinth. He sends them a follow-up letter because Paul's never without some thoughts. <laughs> he sends them this follow-up letter criticizing the behavior, telling them that he's decided he's never going to visit the church again. Now, after some time has passed, Titus comes to find Paul in Macedonia. And he tells Paul that he has been sent by the Corinthian church to let Paul know that they had decided to confront the man. They had decided to discipline him for his behavior. And they wanted Titus to express to Paul on their behalf how upset the church was at itself that they had let Paul down and how deeply grieved they were. In response, you know what Paul does? He decides to forgive the man who had insulted him and tells the church to to no longer discipline him. Basically tells him to, let's just let it go. Let's move on. Not forget that it happened, 
but admit that it is not the final word in their relationship. He writes what we now know as the second letter to the Corinthians, where he expresses all of these desires to reconcile and to be a forgiving person and calls the church in Corinth to reconcile with the man as well. And after all that, that's when we get to this passage in the fifth chapter where he says, you know what, folks, we no longer need to look at each other from a human point of view. We are new creations. The old has passed away, the new has come. Therefore, we are to be ministers of God's reconciliation. It starts with us. We who have been reconciled to God. Now we commit ourselves to the work of reconciling with others. Paul's not a stranger to this hard work of forgiving and being forgiven so that there may be reconciliation. So let's go back to the beginning. To that person you thought of when I asked who's, who's hurt you, who's mistreated you. Remember them? That person who makes us so mad, that person who needs to learn a lesson. I bet thinking about them right now, it's probably even hard to worship, right? You know what comes to mind when I think about that kind of enmity, that kind of strife, and how sometimes it steals my joy even in the midst of of worship. Reminds me of that passage from Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus says, hey, if If you're on your way to make your offering and you remember that someone has a conflict with you or you have a conflict with somebody else, lay your offering next to the altar. Go and find them. Be reconciled. Then come back and make your offering. Even Jesus knows that it's hard to Hard to worship and be generous when we're holding on to those grudges of the past. So like Jesus and like Paul, there is a deep call for us to to be about the work of reconciling. To be about this work of forgiving and being forgiven. Not excusing the past, but looking forward. How might we be brothers and sisters in Christ in the future? So, if that's something you're interested in doing, you might have asked yourself, where do we even begin? And I could give you a long list of things to do and things to say, but I think that's getting too far down the path right now. What if this week all you did was commit to one thing? And that's to say one prayer. When you think about that person, that person who has wronged you, that has mistreated you, that every time you think of them, you see their face and you just start feeling that anger. When you think of them, I want you to say this one prayer. Lord, help me see them like you see me. Help me see them like you see me. Do that every morning this week. See what happens next. I can't promise they'll change anything in their behavior. But you just might be surprised how much it changes you. Amen.
Good morning, I'm David Langston. I've been asked to share a few minutes on stewardship and what it means to me. In the spring of 1972, two high school friends, Murray and David, invited me to come to Alta Woods. They knew I played guitar and wanted me to come and be a part of the music team. That's when I met Sam Morris, who was the youth, pa youth pastor. Please note that my music skills were nothing to be extremely excited about, but Sam had a personality that was very accepting and full of grace. I was overwhelmed with the love and acceptance of that group and its adult leaders, the youth and churches where we presented our programs at, and most importantly, feeling the love and acceptance of Jesus Christ that I fully embraced and accepted. I have since learned that the fact of Christ's love for me and the faith that I embrace can guide me in every situation, even when my feelings might not want to. I have felt God's presence in His hand leading me through many trials and celebrations of life. For instance, college and graduate school, moving through the rocky teenage years of my children, celebrating my children's acceptance of the Christian faith, of faith in Christ, and a divorce and a wonderful second second marriage, a tragic death of a dear friend, the death of my parents, the birth of our grandchildren, a broken and or a strange friendship, and reconciliation on the other side. In each instance, I can honestly say that my family and my church family were there for me, praying and listening. Thanks for letting me share my faith journey and how it influences me and prompts me to service. During this month, everyone will be asked to recommit to their faith in Christ, offer your talents to ministry and service, and provide an estimate of what you can do to support the church with your tithes and offerings. During this time, I hope you will willingly embrace and thoroughly evaluate your time, your talents, your gifts, and your service to the ministries, the many ministries of First United Methodist Church. Thank you for what you've done this year related to stewardship, and please consider what you can how you can best support First Methodist the remainder of this year, next year, and the years ahead. Thanks again. Friends, this past week at our church was just an amazing outpouring of generosity. When I look back on our garage sale and all the volunteers who gave of their time, all the people who came and shopped and got great deals, uh, and because of their generosity are, uh, were able to do more in our missions program, I think of all of you who donated all of that stuff. Thank you for your generous gifts of your treasure. I also think of our blood drive. Uh, just a Another generous outpouring of, of support and love and care for Beverly Yates and her family. It's just amazing how much you have given, not just monetarily, but given of your time and quite literally given of yourself. So I, all I really get to say today is thank you and keep up the good work. It's because of your generous gifts and because of your generosity in the midst of this pandemic that we've continued to be able to be in ministry and mission here in Clinton and around the world. And so I just encourage you to keep up the good work and to donate if you're able. You can do that by mailing your check to 100 Mount Salus. You can also uh, give safely and securely online right now at first, firstmethodistclinton.org slash giving. Also, we're here every day, so if you just want to swing by the church and drop off your gift in person any way that you want to give, we're simply grateful for your generosity. And I can guarantee you, looking into the faces of everyone that I saw this past weekend, I know without a doubt your gifts are making an eternal difference. Thank you. Now, dear friends, as you go out into the world this week, I want to encourage you to remember that prayer. Lord, help me see others the way that you see me. And so now, may you go forth. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance to you, give you peace. And go in that peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.